All right. Well, I'm very happy to talk to you about Monterey pine forests this evening. Um, I am a Monterey Peninsula native, actually born in the old Monterey Hospital. Uh, lived in Carmel Valley for the first 18 years of my life, but then went away to school at UC Berkeley. Worked for a while, went to grad school, got more degrees, and then lived out of state for a while and realized that, oh God, although I found it really interesting, the smell of the ocean and the piney woods really called me back home. And I've been a resident of Monterey County again uh, since 1988. Um, let's have the next slide. All right. Well, we all know about redwood forests. There's a lot published about redwoods, state tree, almost endemic to the California coastline, just a little bit north into Oregon. And next slide. We know a lot about oak woodlands, a poster that uh, displays some of the wildlife species, some of the interesting things associated with oak woodlands, one of the sort of keystone collection of plants in our state, and next slide. Some of us know about mixed evergreen forests, very complicated collections of both broadleaf and coniferous trees, Douglas fir along with madrone and oaks, different kinds of oaks ranging in elevation from, oh, just a few hundred feet on up to almost subalpine conditions. This is the um, Big Sur coastline where mixed evergreen forests predominate. And next slide. Not a lot of us know a great deal about Monterey pine forests. Forests that, for some reason, have been studied widely for their economic benefit. Geneticists, forests, uh, or, or foresters, Forest economists spend a lot of time thinking about Monterey pine forests, but forest ecologists have kind of sort of almost forgotten about Monterey pine forests. And they are very interesting, very unusual, and quite rare. So next slide, please. We're going to have some background looking at California on a broad scale. This is a geologic map. You see the patterns, uh, granitic rock in red, the Batholith of the Sierra Nevada, spots of granitic rock along the California coastline, and I don't know if you can, I don't have a pointer, but um, Monterey Bay right in here with large areas of granitic rock, uh, granodiorites, but also large areas of the interbedded Monterey Formation Shale, which is a sedimentary rock of sandstones and shales interbedded lithified um, nutrient poor, but really extensive outcrops of that in the Monterey region. Next slide. Complicated, complicated pattern <coughs> of geology. The history of California, very, very complicated in terms of accreted terrains and faulting and folding and volcanism, long periods of erosion. Here's precipitation, also recognizable patterns. Recognizable patterns with drier areas in the oranges and yellows, damp, the, the blue and purple. And again, the Monterey Bay, the type locality for Monterey Pine, right there in the middle, kind of at the border of all those different precipitation regimes. And next slide. All of that giving way to vegetation. Again, predictable patterns. Predictable patterns. Let's go to the next slide. Now, California vegetation. I could go on for hours about what influences the patterns of vegetation in California, but we aren't going to stay till midnight. <laughs> um, paleo conditions. What happened over the eons since plants first started evolving? Evolution in response to global climate regimes that were boring and regular and moist and humid during the sort of neotropical period, giving way to cooler, damper, more seasonal conditions during the sort of middle evolutionary period, and then giving way with more seasonality and more mountain building and more variability to 
a time when um, plants evolved in response to seasonal change and variable climates. All of those paleo conditions giving rise to different vegetation types that were evolved in response to those prevailing climatic conditions. And the gradients that California has. Latitudinal gradients from Mexico to Oregon, from dry and warm to cool and damp. And then topographic gradients, gradients that influence the pattern of vegetation from coastal to mountain, uh, aspect from east to west, microclimates developing from even small variability in topographic gradients. California also has that maritime versus more continental type of climate patterns. Maritime conditions along the coast, moderated by the proximity of the Pacific, regularly, you know, moderate, as opposed to inland, think about Modoc County, or on the east side of the Sierra with severe cold winters and hot, dry summers. Parent rock soil, we know a lot about soil. Thank you guys for speaking, <laughs> telling us about your research. It all gets down to the soil, doesn't it? It's very interesting. So reflecting the parent material and the great diversity of geologic types, tremendous diversity in California soils, as well disturbance and the ecology that goes along with the regular, predictable, as well as unpredictable disturbance, and how disturbance ecology influences where plants grow and why they grow, and how they've evolved and adapted to deal with those disturbances. Disturbances can be slow and gradual, or they can be episodic. Think of a flooding regime or uh, a wildfire. What we know, though, is disturbance, no matter what the pattern, no matter what the periodicity, is constant in our California vegetation types. Next slide. So collectively, all those different factors influencing California vegetation, but what about diversity? Well, diversity reflects all of that stuff. All of that stuff, including at the bottom, weirdness, unpredictable <laughs> things, mutations, accidents happen. You know, what about neo-endemics? What is influencing why new plants are evolving? Are they hybrids? Sometimes. Are they adapting to new conditions? Sometimes. But weirdness happens. So next slide, please. Plant diversity hotspots, rarity hotspots. Synthesize all that information about geology and soil and climate and maritime conditions and topography, variability, disturbance. And where are your plant rarity hotspots? The darker green areas demonstrate the most rarity, not necessarily diversity, but rarity. Those species that are endemic or have very restricted populations. Monterey, and I'm going to step over here again. The sites of Monterey pine forest, current population here in Monterey, here on the north Santa Cruz and southern San Mateo coast, and here in the Cambria area of San Luis Obispo County. Hot spots. There is a correlation of why Monterey pines are there. Next slide. So, Monterey pines, eh, you've seen one pine, you've seen them all, right? <laughs> right, right. Let's go to the next slide. What about that environment? It's an iconic environment. Thousands, millions of people see Monterey pines when they turn on the TV and look at the AT&T golf tournaments. Pebble Beach, situated in a Monterey pine forest habitat. That iconic environment characterizes and defines the Monterey Peninsula, the type locality for Monterey pine. Well, Monterey pines certainly are restricted in population today to those three populations on the California coast. 
and two other small populations on islands off Baja, they all at one time were more extensive in extent. Uh, populations in California along the coast range from Marin County down through Riverside County. We found fossil cone material in the La Brea Tar Pits. We see fossil Monterey Pine material up and down the California coast. We know the populations have expanded and contracted in response to climatic changes restricted today to just those three populations and then the two on Baja Islands. They all share a couple things. Fog being one. Bad soil being another. Let's go to the next slide. They're evocative habitats, often even age stands that reflect disturbance. What are those disturbances? Fires, predictable or unpredictable. There seems to be an evolutionary response to fire, meaning that Monterey pine as a species has evolved with adaptations that prepare it for quick reproduction after fires. Uh, they are semi serotonous The cones actually will open in response to heat. It doesn't take a lot of heat, but on the sunny side of a Monterey pine in the summer, the cones might open on a hot day, whereas on the back side of a Monterey mm -hmm. pine in the shadow, the cones may not open. Mm -hmm but they all open in response to fire. Fire coming through an area will kill the parent tree. It'll prepare the ground with a layer of fertilized ash, reducing competition, uh, eliminating the surface veneer of, of organics that might prevent a seed from becoming um, eventually established through a thick duff layer. And next slide also preparing the ground for a whole host of very unusual things. Yeah, you see one pine forest, and it's not about the trees. It's about the forest. You've seen them all, right? No. Within that forest environment of those highly restricted endemic trees, there are very rare things like the pine rose, um, Rosa pinatorum a CNPS-1B plant, and next slide, endemic to only Monterey pine forest habitat. The federally endangered Yadin's rain orchid, Piperia yadenii, or yadonii, depending on how you want to pronounce it, named after Vern Yadin, the emeritus director of the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. Yadin's rain orchid, it's a beautiful thing. It's about a foot and a half tall with tiny individual blossoms on the spike. Um, it has a very cryptic kind of reproductive strategy. Uh, not all corms bloom every year. Not all corms send out leaves every year. First the leaves come out in the, in the uh, early winter, then they wither, and a, a flowering stalk appears in like maybe April and blooms in late June, but it doesn't happen every year. Only a certain percentage of plants in a Monterey pine forest will bloom in any given year. And it's like deer candy. Those things disappear the minute they flower. It must have some really, really attractive thing for deer because they just chow them down. Anyway, federally endangered species that occurs nowhere else but endemic in Monterey pine forest habitat, and actually in this case, only in the Monterey Peninsula area. And next slide. So rare things associated with Monterey pine forest. Indeed, this is a small native onion, Hickman's onion, Allium hickmanii, um, found in pocket meadows and in coastal terrace prairie areas near Monterey pine forest. Another CNPS-1B plant. And next slide. And this plant, Hickman's sink foil, Potentia hickmanii, this was at one time known from only 
one single population. The only known occurrence for a long period of time until it was discovered in the last two decades in uh, maybe a half dozen other locations. This was only known from one wet meadow in the heart of Del Monte Forest in the Monterey Pine Forest. Very interesting, very unusual, highly restricted, endemic to forest habitat. Next slide. So, you think about a forest. You think about a collection of trees and the associated understory, the associated uh, wildlife species and birds and, and insects and mycorrhizal species, soil fungi, all kinds of cool things. But Monterey pines exist certainly as thick forest stands, but also in a mosaic of habitats with all sorts of other kinds of things. This is on the eastern fringe of the Monterey stand of Monterey pines. And it grades into coastal scrub on the Tularcetes, or not the Tularcetes, but the Monterey Formation. Sometimes it's known as the Tularcetes Formation, the uh, interbedded sands and sandstones. But it occurs as a mosaic along with other habitats. And next slide. A mosaic over the hills, uh, northern coastal scrub dominated by things like um, coyote brush and uh, California sagebrush, a little bit of black sage. Uh, why are there pines on some aspects and not others, and on, on some topographic features and not others? Well, it all gets down to the soil. And next slide. Relationships with things like maritime chaparral, probably my most favorite uh, habitat type. Again, restricted to patches of very rare manzanitas and ceanothus only along the coastal fringe of California, but in many places associated, again, with Monterey pines. And next slide. It's the most widely planted pine in the world. It's been genetically modified, been selected, genetic materials taken from all five populations, grown mostly in the southern hemisphere, as a, a, a forest products tree. It's been genet genetically manipulated to grow straight and tall and quick, harvested like corn, uh, only after 15 to 20 years. Lots in New Zealand, Australia, um, Chile, uh, Argentina, South Africa, some in Spain, but vast monocultures, vast forest plantations but in its native habitat, a rare tree. Next slide. Only five populations. The three in the California coastal area and the two off Mexican islands. Go figure. One was connected to the mainland in central Baja, Cedros Island, and down here. And the other, Guadalupe Island, a volcanic island, never connected to the mainland created distantly, um, yet both islands offshore from Baja support Monterey pines. They're different in that they're subspecies. They have two needles instead of three, like our Pinus radiata Monterey pines, yet the genetic sequencing indicates that they are truly Monterey pines. Talk about cryptic differences. Yes, this is, this is a study waiting to happen. And the table um, taken out of that book, uh, just demonstrating how restricted in size the populations have become to the point where um, Cedros Island, um, just 320 acres, Guadalupe Island, I was there in 2001, and we actually counted almost every single tree, and there were about 270 individual trees. That was it at that time. Next slide, please. So, looking at the populations, they're coastal in California, 
The Monterey population is the largest. It ventures the farthest inland. And next slide. Again, the commonality, fog. Predictable advection fog. Coming off the coast, moving inland, or graphically rising in elevation, condensing, and utilizing the needles of the Monterey pine to coalesce fog droplets, condensed fog, into larger and larger droplets, and whoops, eventually falling to the ground, and supplementing the winter precipitation with almost a summer irrigation pattern when the fog is the densest and most intense. Next slide. It's called Pinus radiata because the cones tend to radiate around the branches. Um, a closed cone, semi in that they do open with, um, with heat. Um, male and female cones, Pinus radiata, the Monterey pine, matures in from, from the genesis of a, of a female cone to when it's, it's fully mature and capable of um, releasing its seeds and sprouting um, progeny. 20 months, the longest of any pine species in the state. The seeds are small, they're winged, they um, are released from the scales of the cone and float away from the parent tree some distance. Um, with their wing seeds that actually let them whirly really to some degree or be lofted uh, by the winds. Male and female cones on the same tree, they're monoecious. Um, I don't understand the process of fertilization of the female cone, um, but it has to do with enzymes in the pollen that somehow penetrate the developing uh, cones, the female cones, and are able to fertilize the embryo before the um, surrounding material becomes woody. I don't quite understand that process. Next slide, please. In Monterey, this is a historic image. Um, a little bit hard to understand, but the salmon color that's paler in the background is the historic extent of Monterey pine forest habitat on the Monterey Peninsula. The darker salmon colored is what's currently extant and not in an urban, urban forest setting. The green, bright green, are protected areas supporting Monterey pine. There's not a lot of protected areas. And I'd like you to focus on this Jacks Peak County Park area. That darker salmon and overtone of bright green indicating protected habitat, is the largest existing stand of Monterey pine forest habitat that's native in the world, just inland from the Monterey Peninsula. Next slide. Here are um, Monterey pine, it's a little bit hard to see, Monterey pine forest um, stands and outlying groves in uh, northern Santa, uh, Santa Cruz County and southern San Mateo County. Most of the um, pines are just south of Año Nuevo State Reserve, uh, near the Swanton area, but they grow quite a bit north of Año Nuevo as well, in scattered groves. Next slide. And the southern population in Cambria, um, you see that lighter salmon color in the bottom, urban forest of the town residential development. Bright green with some protected areas, mostly conservation easements that the Nature Conservancy holds. Next slide. And here on Baja, Guadalupe Island and Cedros Island, Guadalupe on the left-hand side with the individual trees, big, giant, stalwart. <laughs> remaining trees. Um, Guadalupe was uh, a site that Captain Cook visited in the 1800s and offloaded goats mm -hmm. as a future meat source for his pirate ships when they needed a place to go and hang out. And um, of course the goats uh, overran the island 
and essentially devastated the, uh, the native vegetation. Um, many, many endemics on Guadalupe, Guadalupe Island. Very few remain, actually, in the uh, aftermath of the goat population. However, the Mexican government actually had a very rigorous campaign of trapping the goats and moving them off the island onto the mainland. And um, the few wily goats that they were not able to trap, they hunted and removed. And as a consequence, the pine forest is actually coming back. The goats had denuded the island of any kind of protective veneer of vegetation, so any rain uh, caused massive erosion, depleting the soil, you know, removing the soil from much of where the Monterey Pines um, should have had the opportunity to see. But with the removal of the goats, and I guess the genesis of organics now under the trees with the, um, the leaf and needle fall, there are um, success stories to be told with juvenile pines coming up to replenish that 270 individual population that um, was there in, in 2001. So there's a, a restoration success story. Cedros Island, very different situation with the, the groves of Monterey Pine. They are, honest to goodness, groves. Um, and they are subject to occasional fires, generally human-caused fires, but they don't have the pressure of the goat grazing that Guadalupe Island did. Next slide. Again, fog. So genetic variability, indeed. Um, not so cryptic, in a sense with cone size, and not so cryptic in a sense with three needles on the mainland populations and two needles on the island populations. But clearly, there are morphological differences in all of the populations. Island biogeography makes sense to me. Um, tenants of island biogeography, the island cones are smaller than the mainland cones. Um, Monterey is right smack dab in the middle. Cambria and the Año Nuevo cones are on the left, much larger, on the periphery of the current populations, the north and southern ends. Next slide. But one thing that the mainland populations share besides the fog are their soils and their geomorphic soil development which in each of the three locations has taken place on a series of marine terraces, wave-cut platforms in bedrock that reflect long periods of time when ocean levels were at a relatively static elevation, long enough to actually, through the wave activity, um, erode platforms in the bedrock. And as sea levels went up, and down, these terrace formations have persisted, sometimes tilted if there's been tectonic activity and not so graphically perfect like this example, but sometimes relatively flat. And these ancient geomorphic surfaces and the pedogenesis or the soil development on these ancient surfaces has given way to Monterey pine forest associations that on each of the terraces is ever so slightly different. Soils on some of the terraces still maintain a veneer of ancient dune sands, aeolian sands. In some places, the dune sands have been worn away, and the soils are very shallow. They're podzolized soils, they're acidic reflecting their coniferous tree relationship. These shallow soils evolving in place over the eons of climatic change when this was all happening have had heavy metals like iron tend to leach to a certain level and form hard pans. So you have hard pans, shallow, nutrient-poor, acidic soils, in some places covered with sand, these are nutrient poor. They are tough, tough soils. They don't percolate moisture. They actually create perched 
water tables. Very interesting soil environment for plants to grow in. So next slide. Here's a, a graphic of the Monterey Peninsula with a sort of a, a color orientation to the age of the marine terraces. They ring the Monterey Peninsula, which is mostly a granodiorite bedrock type with inland soils being on those Monterey Formation interbedded uh, sandstone and shales. And the highest terraces at the highest locations the poorest soils, bless you, have really interesting plants that grow in association with the Monterey Pines. Mostly they're the endemic manzanitas and ceanothus that you find with the globally rare maritime chaparral. Very interesting. So let's go to the next slide. So the soils were studied um, in uh, the mid-1990s by soil scientists affiliated with Jones and Stokes, a consulting um, business uh, consulting outfit in uh, Sacramento. The Jones and Stokes uh, soil scientists did some of the, the early work on Monterey pine forest environments. Just hasn't been studied much. People aren't that curious about it, I guess. And next slide. You know, these shallow, nutrient-poor soils with hard pans underneath that perch water and pond water create in many locations under the canopy of the Monterey pine trees wetland types. So you see rushes and sedges in the middle of a pine forest where there aren't really wetland features otherwise. Sometimes you even see ponded water now, are these wetlands, even though they're in this forest environment? They have the hydrology, they have the, the um, soil, they have the plant indicators, but do you call them wetlands? Hmm, it's a, it's a good question. It's a regulatory question. Next slide. But it complicates everything. And it gets even more pop complicated where in a xeric forest environment where there, there may be... Um, Fog drip in the middle of a summer, uh, you know, a period of intense advective fog with enough condensation and, and fog drip where the percolation isn't happening. You get ponded areas, again, creating these little wetlands. You get things like California red-legged frog, federally threatened. Is this good frog habitat? I guess so. They're reproducing in these puddles. It's pretty interesting. Just makes it all the more complicated. Next slide. And then you have the complication of other very narrowly, narrowly restricted endemic trees, Monterey cypress and Gowan cypress. There are probably a million Monterey cypress planted in this town. But, next slide. The original native range for Monterey cypress is in two groves on the rocky headlands fringing Carmel Bay. That's where the plant is native. Point Lobos, Rocky Headlands, and Pebble Beach, Rocky Headlands. Those are the native growths at the time of first European contact. Now it's just like Monterey Pine, planted worldwide. It grows fast in a garden setting, use it as a screen tree, plant it on a freeway, doesn't need to be watered. Next slide. They're charismatic, beautiful trees adapted to those wind-swept granitic headlands. Pebble Beach is famous for the lone cypress. It's their mm -hmm. brand. It's a Monterey cypress, one of the ne most narrowly restricted endemics in the world. Next slide. And then the Gowan cypress, uh, Hesperus cyperus goveniana. Um, goveniana with a V, because in Latin there are no Ws. Mm -hmm. It's just um, etymology of the word. Inland from the rocky headlands of Point Lobos. Inland, as well inland from the rocky headlands of Pebble Beach in the Morse Reserve. Higher in the marine terrace sequence, not the very top, but higher in the marine terrace sequence, where the soils forming in place over the millennia through the wax and wane of climatic regimes and, and sea level elevations created the worst of the worst soils. 
Next slide. Highly restricted, narrowly restricted endemic that on these marine terrace soils produce pygmy cypress. Very cool. There's a bunch of my students wandering around in the pygmy cypress grove uh, inland from Point Lobo State Reserve. Around them in the background are Monterey pines growing on better soils. The pygmy cypress are, you know, my height and 200 years old. Very interesting environment. Next slide. Pygmy cypress in the, um, in the Morse Reserve, the SFB Morse Reserve in Pebble Beach. Uh, there are some full-sized ones growing on soils that are better developed, often in locations where the hard pan has been broken for some reason, either by a stream incision or by a road cut or something like that. Next slide. And associated with Monterey pine and maritime chaparral and Gowan cypress and Monterey cypress are bishop pine. Not very many. When I think of bishop pine, I think of the Marin and Sonoma coast. And yeah, to some degree, Santa Barbara, the Channel Islands. Um, but bishop pine has outliers in the Monterey area. Next slide. And then there are other rare things, like sand mat manzanita, Arctostaphylus pumila, a maritime chaparral type that you occasionally find under the canopy of Monterey pine forest. Now, does that yeah. tell us that that area used to be maritime chaparral and has been invaded by Monterey pine in the absence of some kind of a disturbance like fire? Or are maritime chaparral and Monterey pine forests somehow connected? The research just hasn't been done. Next slide. Another very restricted endemic, Hooker's manzanita, Arctostaphylus hookeri, same thing. It's a maritime chaparral type, endemic to the Monterey Peninsula. Nowhere else in the world. Maritime chaparral, but occasionally you see it in Monterey pine forests. What's the relationship? We don't know yet. Next slide. And bear grass. We talked about bear grass at dinner. <laughs> Super common in the Rockies. More common in Northern California. Really, uh, gets to its most southern extent in Monterey County, associated with maritime chaparral, again, and Monterey pine forest. And in Monterey, it only blooms like this after it's burned. It needs fire. It is adapted to fire. It becomes reproductively capable after fire. Otherwise, it doesn't send out flowers. This is not a grass. It has blades that resemble a sedge. Um, it's formerly in the lily family. I can't remember what family it's in now. Xerophyllum tenax. Oh, yeah, there we go. Melanthiaceae. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Very unusual but again, associated with our Monterey pine forests. Next slide. Here's another super rare thing that should be federally endangered. It has no state or federal status. It's a CNPS 1B plant. Super rare, Eastwood's Golden Fleece. Nowhere else but the Monterey pine forest and maritime chaparral. All these rare things associated with Monterey pines that are so common, it's the most widely planted timber tree in the world. Next slide. We just don't know enough. And my favorite, I named my dog after this plant, <laughs> Chinkapin. Oh, you know, yes. the, the smooth, wonderful seed pods are held in a spiny, rough burr. You know, that's just like my dog. Sweet on the inside, she has a growly exterior. But um, golden Chinkapin, again, associated with pines. Monterey Pines and with Maritime Chaparral and a disjunct population in the Sierra Nevada foothills in one place. Now, was that formerly Maritime Chaparral? Who knows? Let's find out. Okay, next slide. So, from the dunes, where it's anchored with very widely spreading, laterally spreading shallow roots, to next slide, rocky coastal areas, and next slide, associated with coast live oak, sometimes as a co-dominant, sometimes as a dominant in patches under the canopy here and there. 
Next slide. So in 1992, a bunch of conservation-minded people got together, uh, representatives from CNPS, the Sierra Club, uh, a group, a nonprofit called the Marina Dunes Coalition, um, a gal from uh, Fish and Game at the time, Fish and Wildlife Now, California Fish and Game, joined us. Um, we got together and powwowed about the future of Monterey Pines on the Monterey Peninsula. We liked them. We thought, wow, no one's really caring about Monterey pine forests. There are no advocates for Monterey pine forest. There was a huge development proposal in the Del Monte forest of Pebble Beach, the build out of Pebble Beach, that would have eliminated vast tracts of beautiful Monterey pine forest. So in 1992, this group got together and we thought, we've got to study this. No one's done any work. Yeah, the plant pathologist because of timber related stuff. The plant geneticist because of timber related stuff. The forest economists. But there really weren't ecological studies. So we partnered with CMPS, acting as our umbrella 501c3 nonprofit. We applied for grants and we got um, three pretty extensive grants to sponsor some research. Out of that, um, an offshoot of CMPS of these plant pine enthusiasts grew. We formed our own nonprofit. We called ourselves the Monterey Pine Forest Watch, or more euphemistically, as a term of endearment, the Pine Nuts. <laughs> um, and we thought, okay, well, we need to advocate, we need to educate, we need to spread the word about how interesting and how unusual and how unstudied. Monterey pine forest habitat is, how important it is as a component of the mosaic of habitats, not only around the Monterey Peninsula area, but around Año Nuevo and in southern San Mateo County and in Cambria, where there is a very active um, land trust, uh, the green space in, um, in Cambria, the Cambria Land Trust, that has championed Monterey pine forest. We thought we really we want to have an educational uh, advocacy mission. So we sponsored two symposia. We had a number of articles in the 1990s in Fremontia. Um, we published a brochure, and then we thought, you know, we're not making a big enough impact conservation-wise. After commenting on EIRs and working with the Pebble Beach Company, we were beginning to have some successes, but we decided we'd write a book. So next slide. We did it. It was book by committee. <laughs> it took six years, and literally every comma was deliberated. Every comma. We made it a community effort. We solicited donations from the community. We solicit, solicited photographs and sidebar information from the community. We had enough money to hire a book designer who, since none of us are graphic artists, who put it all together for us. Basically four writers and all sorts of expert helpers, from ph photographers to um, university professors. Next slide. But we're amateurs in a sense. We're not forest ecologists. We wanted to highlight the Monterey area. And next slide. The Año Nuevo area, southern San Mateo County, and look at that marine terrace sequence right there. Very cool. <laughs> Next slide. We realized that in the Año Nuevo area, the population of Monterey Pine was separated by Waddell Creek, <coughs> with pines north and south of that, in the matrix of other forest species. And next slide. Very interesting, we found that knobcone pine on the right top, and Monterey pine on the left top actually hybridize a lower <laughs> cone. Even though their populations are disjunct and they don't mingle, they're separated by about a mile, still there are hybrids in between. No one's ever studied that. So go get some of your PhD buddies <laughs> to study that. Next slide. 
And we wanted to highlight the Cambria area as well. And check out the marine terraces. Very cool. Next slide. In Cambria, the southernmost population, the environment looks just like it does in the northernmost population, on the fringe. And these fringe areas are the important conservation zones where we need to focus attention in terms of protecting habitat, again, for that wax and wane of climatic influence and the expansion and contraction of the forest environment. Where is it going to go? It's going to go in these fringe areas to the north and to the south, just like it has for millennia. Next slide. So our book talked about the cultural importance of Monterey pine forests and included sections on the ecology of disturbance, both the Native American disturbance that we know was hugely influential with Native American burning practices, changing the look of our landscape, and perhaps even the, um, the pace of evolutionary adaptation to fire remains to be seen. Next slide. We wanted to talk about the cultural uses in terms of extractive uh, logging practices for both fuel, for heating and industrial activities, heating uh, your homes, mm -hmm. cooking, um, the Carmel Mission, sort of that iconic look in a treeless landscape. Certainly a coastal prairie, but the trees have all been logged. Um, the lower slides, pictures of Carmel, uh, the one on the lower right, that's downtown Carmel and Ocean Avenue during the early years in Carmel as a bohemian enclave uh, at the turn of the last century. Next slide. Pines have always inspired people. Bless you. And we found that there was a huge artistic appreciation for Monterey Pine Forest how, again, evocative the forest can be with fog, and how unusual it can be with oaks that have lace like in the Ramalina, all your bryophyte <laughs> aficionados. <laughs> this is a photograph of the old Carmel Camera Club that's been photoshopped into a Monterey pine forest. But a lot of the images were of Monterey pine trees because they're charismatic. They're unusual, they're interesting, they're not tall and straight and quick growing like they are in the forest plantations. Next slide. They inspire people uh, for wildlife paintings. This is a very um, true to life image of a red shoulder hawk, a forest bird that's common in our Monterey Pine Forest on the Monterey Peninsula. Next slide, that was a commissioned work. Um, a, a painter that is no longer with us, S.C. Yuan, one of my favorites, had these beautiful impressionistic images of Monterey pine trees. They're fantastic. Next slide. A contemporary artist, Tom Killian, a good friend of mine who does Japanese style wood blocks, um, has used the Monterey Peninsula and the, and the Monterey pine forest and its associated mosaic habitats for a lot of his work. Um, this is one he let us use and, and reprint in the Pine Book. Next slide. As well, authors and writers, poets, from Robinson Jefferson on the top to uh, Robert Louis Stevenson in the middle and George Sterling, one of the early Bohemians in Carmel, a lot of literary work was inspired by the Monterey Pine Forest around the Monterey and Carmel regions. Next slide. So the book talks about cultural uses, the, the importance of the ecology in terms of fire, um, the artistic uh, appreciation for Monterey Pine, and then goes into a discussion of wildlife, and next slide, plants, um, different wildlife species, uh, and plants. Uh, we have appendices of plant lists that are specific to plant lists and bird lists and reptile lists and butterfly lists and C and DDB lists <laughs> that are specific to each of the three mainland populations as appendices in the book. Next slide. Cool things that are just very unusual and interesting to, to um, ponder the, the uh, utilization of Monterey pine and eucalyptus, mind you, by 
migrating monarch butterflies. Um, what did they do before there were eucalyptus? Where, where did yeah. they roost? <laughs> Modern pines, pines, but on the coast, farther south, in riparian areas. As long as there was shelter from the wind, nectaring food plants, the perfect humidity. Um, but they found that on the Monterey Peninsula in the pines. Next slide. So, uh, the Monterey Pine Forest book, um, published by, independently by the Monterey Pine Forest Watch. We started the Pine Nut Press to do that. Uh, our mi mission was educational. We tried to convey the message that this has been happening for a century now, the fragmentation of Monterey Pine Forest habitat. Not necessarily a good thing, um, but again, very little research has been done on what are the impacts of forest fragmentation on adjoining native pine forest habitat. Are there more infestations of non-native pathogens like, like pine pitch canker? Do there tend to be more tree falls without the buffer of the associated soldiers as first lines of defense in a forest environment against buffeting winds? Next slide. There was a very overt conservation message in the book, although people have said, oh, it's so subtle. <laughs> For us, it was quite overt. We have shared uh, information about Monterey Pine Forest with groups like the Point Lobos Foundation, which is a supporting friends group for the state park, Point Lobos uh, State Reserve, which is now undergoing a general planning process for lands that it acquired over the last 20 years east of Highway 1 that support Monterey Pine Forest. So our book has been helpful in introducing um, the wider uh, public, as well as the interested public, but the wider public to how unusual and worthy of conservation, how worthy of attention Monterey Pine Forests are. Next slide, please. We've had people come and, and look. Brett Hall of the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum. Um, he's really interested in, in maritime chaparral. He thought the maritime <coughs> chaparral associated with Monterey Pine Forest was fascinating hard to tease out what's going on there in the absence of disturbance. Are pines coming in or are they being outcompeted? No one's really paying attention. Next slide. And Monterey Pine Forest problems we've illustrated for the general public. Um, certainly what happens with fire on the urban wildlife or urban <laughs> wildland fringe where homes are built right up against the edge of a very fire prone and fire adapted habitat. The top right, pitch canker, devastating large tracts of Monterey pine forest habitat, particularly in the mid 1990s. When it was first discovered in the mid 1990s, the dire draconian predictions were for 85% of all native Monterey pines to succumb and die. That hasn't happened. Mm. And the forest pathologists have come to realize that there is a certain amount of acquired immune resistance that certain Monterey pines are now exhibiting. They get the disease. They're infected with the pathogen, but they don't die. They kind of shake it off which is really interesting, because that wasn't happening 20 years ago. Also, there's a huge uh, weed infestation, Janista and Spanish broom, French broom, Spanish broom, Scotch broom. Um, and then the challenge of the urban forest. What do you call a forest and what do you not? When you have individual trees surrounded by a built environment, and Carmel, the city of Carmel, prides itself on its tree protection ordinances, well, how realistic are those? Are they doing any good? Are they preserving the character but not the ecology of a forest? Questions that a sociologist might want to ask. Next slide. And this is what happens when you build next to Monterey pine forest areas. Um, they are shallow rooted trees. Remember, they're existing in a very shallow soil on top of hard pans. Nutrient poor, they have widely spreading roots. They tend to fall over pretty easily. <laughs> they don't live long. They tend to be old at 120 years. And yeah, 
you put your house next to a pine forest, you're in for a surprise and a big win. <laughs> next slide. Um, there are reproduction issues. How do you manage a forest that likes to burn, that might need to burn, that has a hard time uh, producing seedlings when viable seed, which are stored in the seed bank on the tree, are released onto a forest floor without there being mineral soil in direct contact for seeds to germinate in? How do you initiate a reproductive cycle that's successful without burning. It's very difficult. Next slide. That's a seedling. How do you deal with the proximity of our urban environment and our rural, de rural residential areas with a burning ecosystem? A management challenge. Absolutely. Next slide. So we identified these three conservation zones and for the last 20 years have advocated for, um, oh, you know, protective ordinances, um, landowner incentives to maintain Monterey Pine Forest Habitat. We've reviewed city ordinances. We've actually lobbied heavily the open space districts. And I'm happy to say that in our target zone around Jack's Peak Park, the largest intact Monterey Pine Forest in the world, all the area to the north, this, um, I probably can't tell, but that, that area to the north of what it, where it says Jack's Peak Park was just in the last six months purchased by the Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District from the Pebble Beach Company. It was developable, prime real estate, and for a good price, we've added 900 acres of protected Monterey Pine Forest habitat. It's Phenomenal, but again, it's not just pines. There's great maritime chaparral, fantastic Yadens piperia populations. All the suite of all those super rare things occurs in that addition to Jack's Peak Park. Next slide. Um, and I think that might be the last one. Is it? Why don't we go one more? Let's see. It's, oh, no. Um, so the last educational message that we wanted to share with the, with the public was get out and go for a walk. Go and explore your Monterey Pine Forest habitats. So we made a concerted effort to identify all the publicly accessible parklands that support Monterey Pine Forest habitat, both north of Monterey in the Año Nuevo Swanton area and south of Monterey in Cambria, and certainly on the Monterey Peninsula. And next slide. We did a little description and a map with hiking trails that are all GPS correct uh, for all these places that support Monterey Pine as an encouragement for the public to go out and explore these areas. Use the appendices in the back of the book to identify those cool plants and butterflies that they find. And hopefully the conservation message subtly permeates their psyche. <laughs> and we form more new pine nuts to help us. And hopefully, future pine nut researchers over here, right? Okay, thank you. That's the last one. And I'm happy to.